I believe you are all here. Very good. Okay, we're just a few minutes late, but we'll go ahead and get the Johnson City Council meeting number 21-06. We'll call it to order. Cindy, roll call, please. Councilmember Coe? Here. Evans? Here. Martin? Here. Ready? Here. Temple? Here. Moving on the agenda, first we want to welcome everyone that is with us this evening, and it looks like we have a fair number of uh, attendees with us this evening. So if you are a member of the public and if you would like to speak to the council at, uh, on any item that is on the agenda, uh, please wait for that item to come up and indicate by raising your hand at that time, or I guess indicating in the chat room um, that you would like to speak and, and Cindy will let you in. Um, if you're here for an item that is not on the agenda, there will be an opportunity under public communications to um, make comment. Next item on, on the agenda is the agenda approval. Jim, is there any changes to the agenda? No changes to the agenda this evening. Okay, council, any changes? If not, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? Move approval. Second, Martin. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote please. Councilmember Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Temple? Yes. Hope? Yes. Motion passed. Next item on the agenda is public communications. And we don't have any scheduled public communications this evening, but we did carry forward an item from the work session, which is a review of the um, various studies, activities, um, other efforts that are going on within the city of Johnson and uh, with, with some uh, plan to discuss briefly the gas house, greenhouse gas emission study, the proposed greenhouse gas emission study and the Historic Preservation Commission. So Jim, do you wanna walk us through the information that's been provided and this, this again, you will find under the work session materials. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, so when we had our strategic planning session late last year and early this year, we had gone through a lot of um, uh, items that we want to work on as a city and, and came up with quite a few um, uh, plans and, and um, initiatives that we were are going to take on. and, and uh, um, and the council's very aware of that um, because of the, the amount of time we spent doing the planning for those areas. There were two items that um, we did not get to as far as having a um, conversation whether to include these in our um, initiatives going forward. One being the um, idea of uh, completing a, a greenhouse gas emissions inventory. And this came out of the um, climate Change Committee that is a, a group of citizens that are, are working on how we address the climate change uh, within our community and, and around the world. The other um, item is related to the um, Historic Preservation Commission and as the council's aware and we've had a, actually a presentation on um, different council members have had presentations on both of these issues but um, the idea of having a historic preservation commission, which becomes an actual commission under the city government in that the mayor and council would appoint members to the commission and they have certain functions related to our historic preservation. This came out of um, an idea from our historic society. And as you're aware, the historic society is, is um, works on um, maintaining the records of our history or the history of Johnston, but they're a, a private group. They're not appointed by the mayor and council. And um, so with each of these proposals, they were proposed by groups that work with the city, but are not necessarily under our government, but um, they requested for the city to take on a, a bigger role in um, uh, doing the greenhouse, admission, um, greenhouse gas emission study, and then also possibly creating a historic preservation commission. So in light of this conversation, uh, the mayor and I talked and, and with all the activities that we had planned through our uh, strategic planning process, um, it was requested that I give the council a, a, a list of what our current and future studies and initiatives. And um, Cindy, if you could bring that up. 
I provided this to the city council with the council packet. And um, I really got this information from, if you recall in our, in our um, strategic planning, we had a, a large Excel worksheet where when we broke down into smaller groups uh, at our strategic planning sessions, we came up with a lot of ideas and then just sort of narrowed it down to where the, our focus would be. And so as you look in this document, I've tried to break it down into activities we're currently, that are currently taking place or have been directed by staff to work on. I broke it down by department, including if there's some expense related to each of these and um, you know, if there's staff hours that are related to these. So to give you an example, um, we, uh, we, are in the, we need to start working on redesigning our performance management system. And that came out of our, our discussions of the strategic planning. It's going to cost around fifteen to seventeen thousand dollars, and we anticipate about two hundred hours of, of staff time to work with our consultant on on this process. If you go down to communications, which is just below the middle of the page, uh, Janet's currently working on a website redesign. Um, obviously, that's an important communication component for us. Um, there's not a cost related to that because it's included in our our. Um, cost of our, our contract that we have with our website designer and, and the group that manages it. But um, we will anticipate spending up to 240 staff hours in doing that. So, so that gives you an example of a couple of things we're working on. There's, there's quite a list there. And then we also included some future studies and initiatives towards the end. And those are items that again, have been identified and we've talked about but we haven't actually started some of those at this point in time, but they are planned for a couple years down the road. And I did include in this group, um, the, um, the uh, greenhouse gas study as well as the Historic Preservation Commission. So really the, the, what we wanted to do was to um, focus really on those two items. A lot of these other items that are, are here are either already started or they're within our capital plan and, and many of them are now within our, our comprehensive plan or our, our um, um, uh, strategic plan. And so what the purpose for tonight in our work session was to talk about the greenhouse gas emissions inventory as well as the um, Historic Preservation Commission and get direction from the city council whether we wanted to take these projects on um, as well. So that's a brief review of, of how we got here. And, and uh, again, I wanted to spend time at the work session to, to talk about these and, and get some direction from the, from the council with these two items. Comments? So, so Jim, if we, if we agree to do these two items, the greenhouse gas study, and the Historic Preservation Commission. I mean, later tonight, we're also setting our budget. We didn't fund either of these two items in our budget. And I always get a little, to me, I kind of like to look at all these things um, kind of all at the same time uh, because it's hard to sort of say, yeah, let's do this and then come back, you know, six or 12 months down the road and say, oh, remember you committed 85,000 for this and knowing that if I, you know, if my choice is between 85,000 for that or hiring another police officer, I maybe would have rethought making that decision. So I get a little nervous sort of pre-committing ourselves to things without kind of knowing all the different choices that are out there. Um, and so, it, and I, so I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with kind of our, our decision-making flow process, because to me, we have, um, uh, you know, we have, we, you know, we do kind of a community survey, survey, and then we have our strategic planning process, and then we have the budget process. And we, uh, I mean, so it, 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 when we start having, talking about these other kind of funding priorities or staff commitment priorities outside of that, it's, it, I, I struggle with that because to me, it, it, it it's, it's, the, 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 we don't really see the different trade-offs we have to make. That's why you have a budget process. So you can, everything, all of these things sound really good and I think are really positive for the city, but at some point you have to make a decision. You can't do all 10 things that really are good for the city. You, you only have enough money for five or six of them. And that's, that's, and that's kind of the hard decisions you have to make as, as an elected official. Well, if we kind of put these two items out there and say, okay, yeah, we're going to do it. 
um, ahead of time, then it's hard to know which of those other items off the list are we taking off the table because we've kind of committed to those. So I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with why these two items haven't been included in more in centrally into that budget discussion process or strategic planning process, um, the community survey process, um, but now we're talking about them. So that, that's a little bit of a frustration on my part. And I understand that we, we, um, we had presentations on both of these items uh, la late last year. And, and um, uh, when we started the strategic, strategic planning process, we did include these, but we just never got to a decision point when we brought the items back from our works, our small group discussions with the council. These were two issues that we never got completed as far as uh, fully vetting this uh, on whether these are priorities for the city council. So we didn't include these in our priorities. And they're, again, they're, you know, they're, they're initiatives that were, have been proposed to us from groups that we work very closely with at the city, although they're not really a, a city function at this point in time. And so that's why it's sort of, I, I agree, this is not the typical process, but given the, the timeline and time frame that we had with the strategic planning this year, these two items didn't end up getting any um, uh, enough discussion uh, with what our priorities are gonna be. So, so Jim, as I look at this list, and it's even longer than what I had imagined, um, you know, when, when we talked about having this conversation this evening about, about uh, the greenhouse gas study and, and the Historic Preservation Commission, I knew that there was a lot of other stuff going on out there. And I was trying, I was trying to get my head around everything that was going on. And, and that's why I asked you to work with staff to develop a list of the things that are going on. And, you know, one of the things that I shared with you and I'll share with the, with the council, and that is that, you know, many years ago, I got, I received some really good advice from an elected official that I worked with. And that is that, you know, he was told when he first became an elected official uh, by someone that had been in the position for a while that, you know, you might want to do, you know, there's, there's a lot of things you're going to want to do. You know, there may be a hundred things that you want to do, but the fact of the matter is you can't do everything well. You have to set priorities and decide what it is that, that um, you really want to do and make sure that you do those things well. And I'm getting a little concerned that we're trying to do everything. When I look at this list, I mean, I, I worry about um, the funding resources that we're going to have available. I worry about the staffing resources that we're going to have available to do all of these things. Um, and I worry about our ability to do any of them well if we're trying to do everything for everyone. So uh, that's just, you know, kind of some, some uh, thinking out loud that I wanted to share with everyone. Having said that, you know, it seems to me that what we need to do with this list now that we have it, um, because it's still just a little bit unclear, particularly when I look under the future studies and initiatives planned or under consideration. It's still a little unclear to me, you know, what has been fully committed to, what we have committed any funding to, um, you know, uh, you know, what, uh, where, where all of these things, uh, how all of these things compare uh, with, with each other in terms of what we have planned. So I guess what I'd like to suggest is that we take this, this material that we have now, try to develop a matrix that shows, you know, what, what are these initiatives? How much are they going to cost? How much staff time is it going to take to do them? Where are we at in the process? What is the timeline here? What staff has been assigned to do it? I mean, we may find of these 50 things, we've got two people, three people that are, that are, you know, that are tasked with doing all of these things. And obviously that doesn't make any sense. That's, that's an exaggeration, but I'm just offering that as a, to, to make a point. Um, I think we need to take this list back to the, to the finance committee and work through that process and make sure that, that we are, you know, that, <laughs> that we know where we're at with all of these things and then I think we'll be in a better position to, to you know, set priorities and, and make sure that we're spending our money wisely and using our staff wisely. I'd like to add, if there's any way that we could do all that and somehow relate the 
survey results, if we got some, some of these, you know, may somehow tie into something on the survey that's very, very important right. to our residents. Um, add that as part of the prioritization. Um, Mayor and uh, Council, I, I would like to say that I totally agree with what the mayor has just stated about uh, being an organized approach to, to all of these um, commitments. I 100% agree. And I also um, feel that we, we try, you know, we unfortunately ran out of time and was at the November, December meeting and we didn't get to the point where we could have this group discussions about some of these uh, staff time commitments and and where they fell on our priorities. So I agree with all of those things. Um, there is a little bit of a time frame pressure on the greenhouse gas emissions, not a huge one, but there is some. And uh, I don't know where we're going to go with this, but I'll just I just will say that um, Eric Giddens and the University of Northern Iowa, there are students there that are willing to put together this greenhouse admission study for us at a fairly low cost in terms of staff time. Um, and it does not mean that we are committed to an $85,000 uh, uh, environmental plan. It just means that it's, it's the, it's the records, it's the, um, it's the information needed to go on to a, 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 a plan for the city in terms of where we could lower our emissions um, in an economical way. So that's all I wanted to say. I, do, I don't disagree with anything anybody has said here. Um, but that, I mean, this was, started back in September, I think, or even earlier about the, you know, this offer of this free study. And unfortunately, it's got, it, you know, it didn't get talked about when, when it would have been a better time to have it talked about. Um, and Eric Giddens is now at the legislature, they'll be wrapped up sometime in April. Um, I don't know if he's got anybody that's going to be working in the summer. So there is some time to figure this out, but we should have an answer for him this summer so that he can plan it. Thank you. Well, I was going to add a little bit. Um, I agree with what everybody has said and also concerned about the budget cost that's there. We haven't budgeted for that things. Having said that, you know, greenhouse, every day we delay is a day that we make our atmosphere things bad for us, bad for our health and everything else. So I strongly consider that, but the cost does seem a little high. Maybe what the mayor suggests, do a metrics and see how things work out and see a priority based of that and make, make a priority of that. So let's go with that and see how that goes. I would add that I, I think that it would be helpful. Uh, I don't know who, who is the main point of contact with, um, with with Senator Geddens to sort of figure out what the timetable is. Councilman Martin, you mentioned sort of that there was timetable issues. It'd be helpful to know more about that. Of, you know, when, what's the when's the best window of opportunity? Because I mean, I think that's that's all that's something that could be factored into this matrix too. That sort of says, right. hey, you know. Um, there's a reason to do this now as opposed to, you know, six months from now or whatever. So, I mean, I think that's, I, 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 I think we need to have a strategic decision-making process. I think this matrix helps us to do that. And so I think that we should move towards that, especially given the limited resources that we've got. I agree. I think the matrix approach makes sense. Okay. Anything yeah, that, that that's something we can work on and, and work through the finance committee to continue the conversation. Just one more thing to do, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Mayor, Virginia Solberg um, has asked to speak as well. Okay. We are still on our public communications. So um, is, have you let Virginia in? I have, I have, she just, there she goes. Okay. okay. I. Uh... Virginia, just a second. This is, this is like, pretend like we are at the city council chambers. You need to state your name and your address. <laughs> Virginia Solberg, 5979 Dogwood Circle, Johnston, Iowa. And I did submit my comments. I don't know if they made it through or not. Um, but the uh, we did not ask for $85,000. That would be if the, sur the survey is a baseline. It's just before you start making suggestions and looking for answers, you have a baseline to know where you're at. So that if progress is made, we spot it. If it's not, we don't. So the, it really is only a ask for some time, I heard between you know, about 20 hours, maybe up to 40 hours total for a staff person, which, and we asked for this a long time ago. Um, the other thing, if I understood uh, Councilman Evans correctly, he was saying that if you look at greenhouse gas admissions, that helps you, everything you do needs to consider what kind of an environmental impact you make. And so if we have a baseline that can help you in decision-making. So I think it's something that needs to come that the matrix can use as a tool to make good decisions for the rest of the matrix. Mm -hmm. so I guess that's my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Virginia. Cindy, is there anyone else would like to address the council under public communications? No one has indicated that. Okay, let's give them just 30 seconds. If there's anyone else that is with us this evening that would like to address the council on an item that is not otherwise on the agenda, now would be the time to do that. Can you indicate that by just uh, typing into the chat box that you would like to do that? I see none. Okay, then we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is public hearings. We have two public hearings this evening. First one being to conduct a public hearing for the 2021-2022 budget and consider resolution number 20-70, adopting the budget for fiscal year 2021-2022 and authorizing tax levies on all taxable properties within the city of Johnston. Resolution 21-71, confirming and establishing public purpose for economic development, arts, and culture. And resolution number 21-72, approving transfers for 2021-2022 fiscal year. And we'll open this public hearing at 7.30. Teresa? Good evening, Mary Council. Um, Cindy? Thank you. Um, my presentation is the very last attachment on the, thank you. Teresa, I will have to tell you that I have not gone through every one of those exhibits. You haven't? <laughs> Crushed. Have time. Drafting the rest of my life. <laughs> limits how many attachments you can have on an, <laughs> an item. Uh, um, I'd like to, uh, I have a, a, a brief PowerPoint uh, presentation or, um, that I'd like to go through. And I'm not going to spend a great deal of time again on that and all the details. It's in the memo. It's in all of those exhibits and such. But I would like to point out that um, our regular taxable evaluation has um, grown um, an average of, um, over the past six years, an average of 6.43%. This past year, our actual evaluation growth was 13.56%, which was our 100% valuation when I say our actual valuation. Our taxable valuation was 3.28%. And then over um, a 10 year comparison, our population has grown approximately 2.3% per year um, for a total of 13.8%. We're still waiting for confirmation or any indication of when we will get our 2020 census numbers. And um, that has not been confirmed or um, kind of tends to be pushed back is my understanding. So. Um, on the next side, slide, we have some additional um, statistics about our growing community. I asked each of um, uh, 
the departments to provide information. That's what's basically been on these two slides about both police, fire, public works, water, sewer, our utility customers, those types of things. And we tried to do um, a six year growth um, average for our, our areas of um, work that we've had in the past several years. So um, in 2022, um, for fiscal year 2022 budget preparation, there were a number of significant factors that we dealt with when um, working on our budget or building our budget. And we've all heard uh, numerous times about uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic and how that's affected so many uh, various areas of everyone's life. And um, the city of Johnston was no exception to that and neither was working on our budget or our audit as we talked about earlier um, this evening. Um, we experienced those issues that we had never had to deal with as far as um, employee health, employee um, um, sicknesses and, and being away and public uh, not being able to access us and um, getting um, everything electronic, electronic council meetings. There's been a, quite a discussion on the International City Managers um, discussion board about, quite frankly, how all these virtual council meetings have really increased for um, increased participation in communities across the country. So it's been, everyone's trying to figure out how to do a hybrid meeting, hybrid meetings now because they seem to have had a lot more people get involved. And uh, Cindy and I've talked about that a little bit, but um, we obviously, we in the middle of all that, we um, moved into our new city hall and we tore down the old city hall. We've had lots of construction around this building and we'll continue to work on those things. We had a huge intersection and public infrastructure project happening right out here at 62nd and Merle Hay. And then we continue to work on um, our annexation issues to the north and infrastructure and how we're going to um, address that here in the future. And then of course, as our uh, community, community continues to grow, we uh, deal with that increased need for public safety, police and fire. And, um, and we had some public unrest the past year that we had never had before in, in our area. So lots of different issues that we had going on. Next slide, please. And tonight's um, council meeting or this public hearing is um, basically to establish a property tax rate of $10.63 per $1,000 worth of tax taxable valuation. That's the exact same rate as our residents paid last year. So there's been absolutely no um, increase uh, for our residents when it comes to the tax rate. If there's been a change in their taxable valuation, there will be a change in their city's portion of their property tax bill. The tax rate did not change. Uh, we had um, decision packages uh, totaling over a million dollars presented to the council during our work sessions. And uh, it was determined that um, this year we would be using some of our local options, sales and service taxes, um, as allowed by our referendum for some police officer, public safety individuals, and also for parks program, which is uh, the continued uh, treatment of our emerald ashes, ash trees within the community. Um, we also had decision packages that are going to be, um, that were approved uh, that were approved to be paid for out of a non-tax supported um, area. So it was either from our reserve or some sort of other, other source. Um, these uh, decisions, uh, decision packages, of course, are all listed here. If you have any questions or a reminder about any of those, I'd be happy to go back and touch on those. Uh, we had the uh, request, funding requests from our outside organizations. The only... Um, change in the dollar amount that was approved or made was for community education and it's a lower dollar amount. Uh, their budget came, their budget request came in lower. It's based on the 28E agreement we have with the schools and uh, it's based on the salary and the budget of their community education director. Teresa, so, let me just interrupt real quick. Somebody's shuffling papers. Oh, it's probably just me. Oh, okay. <laughs> on my I'm sorry. I okay, not a problem. Um, uh, her, uh, his salary was uh, slightly lower than uh, the director who had retired and left. So the funds went down a little bit. Uh, the Johnston Art Council did not ask the city council for any funds. 
but would uh, ask that the funds that we had budgeted for FY21 that they did not spend be still allocated to them and that was $2,200. Um, uh, some significant funding or significant public improvements that we're gonna be working on in FY22. Obviously those, some of those are already starting right now in calendar year 21 and, and will continue into uh, fiscal year 22. Uh, we took, had several meetings where we worked on our capital improvement plan and um, those projects are all listed on this slide and the next two slides. I'll give you a minute here to look at some of these. Um, if you have any questions about those projects or do you like a refresher on what that project was about or where it was gonna um, go or what we were trying to do, uh, I or our department director would be happy to address that. But I believe we had our public hearing on, on the capital improvement plan at the first meeting in January this year. And that was approved and has been uh, included then in this year's budget. If you'll note some of these stormwater projects, uh, Dave Wilberding from Community Development wanted to make sure that I noted that that's just the engineering that's being worked on right now so that the neighbors aren't concerned about what might be happening there. We're not ready for that yet. There'll be plenty of public meetings like he always does when the time comes for those projects. But um, we noted what the engineering would be for those projects. And then here were some parks projects. Uh, you saw the news release towards the end of last week on the Trestle Trestle Bridge. That's an exciting one that's coming up and will be getting done finally in 2022. On this particular slide is the history of our property tax rate. And um, we talk about the tax rate and the tax levy and, and, um, and I kind of interchange those words and I don't necessarily, necessarily mean to other than the state budget form has actual by code um, levy language that they are allowed, allow us to charge. And so that's why I use the levy word here. There's a general tax levy. We're only allowed to charge up to $8.10. There's a general revenue levy. We can only charge for certain things. So that's why I use that uh, in this particular case. And then it boils down to the tax rate for the citizens of Johnston. But proposed here, as I said, for FY22, the rate is exactly the same as the year before. We have the general fund, special revenue fund, which are employee benefits, and then our debt service levy. And then on this slide, um, not to confuse everyone, but we have um, what's called the consolidated tax levy or tax rate for citizens. So we all know that when people get their property tax bill, they have a tendency, unfortunately, to say, I got the city tax bill. It's not just a city tax bill. There's a lot of people that charge um, our taxing entities for our residents that live within the community. And currently in the year we're in right now, that total rate is $39.94 94,581 per thousand dollars. Of that amount, $10.63 is the city of Johnston or 26.6% of the total tax levy rate that you pay when you live in the city of Johnston is for the city of Johnston. So um, sometimes for people like me who have been in local government forever, take it way personally, get pretty defensive. It's not just the city tax bill. Um, there really are other entities. And on the next slide, we point out that those other entities are the county, uh, the hospital, Broadlawn Hospital, Ag Extension, the county assessor, DART is the regional transit. Um, Area 11 is actually DMAC, the county college. And then of course the schools are, is the Johnston Community Schools. And so those percentages are what are making up in this particular slide, we, I, only, I didn't carry the decimal point out, uh, three out, out a point. So, um, but this is the percentage for the year we're in right now. Since I don't know what everybody else is taxing for this coming year of FY22, I don't have this updated yet. That's why the chart numbers are this way. And then the next slide is somewhat the same, except that I um, have always made this comparison of the other metro communities uh, surrounding us. 
And in this particular slide, um, I have added two columns now um, that talk about additional revenues the city gets. So um, some cities charge what's called a utility franchise fee that brings in additional revenue for them. And they have uh, the local option sales tax like we do right now. So um, obviously that should say yes by Des Moines, by the way, at the bottom, and that's just a typo. The only one that it should say no on in that local option sales tax column is Ankeny, city of Ankeny, all the rest are a yes now. And um, the utility franchise fee, all of the, um, not all of the cities, but several cities um, generate some pretty good revenue. Um, as an example, the city of Des Moines gets about $18.8 .8 million of utility franchise fee revenue. And um, I believe the um, city of um, Altoona, where did they go? Is a little over $3 million for their um, franchise fee. So those are some pretty good revenue sources for other cities. Uh, the city of Johnston only has that only for Mediacom and that money goes directly into the library trust, library foundation trust fund. That's where the uh, Mediacom cable franchise fee goes. So if you look at the first set of columns, it talks about all the levies that we're allowed to charge to our residents. And you'll see that Johnston, this is our current rate and then our next year's rate because it didn't change. And it's everyone's FY21 rate because I don't know everyone's new rate, okay? So if you look at that, the city of Johnston, uh, our debt service rate of $2.33 per thousand, almost 234 is, um, it's like the fourth, um, the fourth highest debt service levy in the Metro. However, uh, you'll see Windsor Heights now is at 231.6, Grimes is at 231.4, we're at 233. There's three of us that are really grouped closely together right there now. Whereas before we were, we were quite a bit higher than everyone else. So that's come uh, much better into line with a number of them. So that would put us right in there with seven of them and, and others. The general fund levy, which um, I'm looking at the column that says subtotal general slash, slash special levy. So everything that it takes for us um, at, to get to that point of our general levy, Johnston is the second lowest. Ankeny is the lowest at 675 and Johnston comes in at 829. The rest of them, that's your general operating levy. The rest of them are higher than that. So I think, again, you as a council, we as staff have done a, a phenomenal job um, keeping our expenses down. The next graph is just a graph I do every year just to show our residents if they had a $100,000 home. So you have 100, 200, 300, you hopefully can easily multiply what your property tax rate should be for your for your home and based on a hundred thousand dollar home with the change in rollback even though our tax rate did not change your taxes would go up fourteen dollars and thirteen cents for the year so a little over a dollar a year a dollar a month excuse me the next chart would uh, tells that person who has the hundred thousand dollars a year that, that $599.66 they pay a year in property taxes, what am I really paying for? And so for $158.79, they're getting 24-7, 365 days a year, police coverage, fire coverage, all the trails they could possibly ever want to walk on, a library to go to, I mean, numerous things. So, um, you know, this is the explanation for those areas that are supported by property tax dollars. This is just a, a quick graph showing you what all of our revenue sources are for FY22. Of all of our revenue sources, 21% of our um, 
$613 million worth of revenue next year is 21% of it is property taxes. Regular general property taxes, not local option sales tax, not TIF revenue, but just general property tax dollars. Then of our expenditures, um, depending on which, which pie you wanted to look at, public safety, 11% of our revenues are, or expenditures are public safety. 22% are water, sewer, or stormwater, our enterprise funds. Um, 21 are capital improvement projects, whichever you'd like to look at. And then this next chart, um, the Iowa League of Cities completed a special report on city property tax levies back in 2018. And uh, the total city levy rates were analyzed with different models and methods. And this chart looked at the average total city levy rates based on property valuation densities or weighted by evaluation across the state. And the method took into consideration that urban communities may generally apply their total city tax rate across a much larger span of properties or total valuation. So the averaging done this way takes into consideration all of these densities. And you'll see that the average back in 2018 was slightly over $14 and six cents or eight cents, I think that says, maybe it's just $14, my eyes are blurry and we're down at 10.63. And then in closing, I guess, uh, in summary, um, this is really high numbers for us this year, but it includes $33 million of revenue and $33 million of expenditures for a town center. So that's, that's the outlier for you guys to remember. We're usually down in the 70 millions but our revenues in the budget for next year are $113,364,264. And our expenditures are $114,888,524. And we uh, anticipate a funding ending balance of $40,031,133. And for all of the funds and the fund balances, we do anticipate spending um, approximately $1,524,260 more than we take in over all um, of the six fund, uh, six major funds. Here was the breakdown of each of those general special revenue, TIF special, debt service, capital, and proprietary. So that was really quick. Next slide says questions. I was really quick, tried to review a whole lot of information with a whole lot of work that we all did. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Teresa, could you go back to the slide on the uh, league information? Sure, there you go. You know, is that, a, is that a report that's fairly short or is there an executive summary or something of that? Sure, and I have it. I can okay. I would, I would love to see that because, you know, I've always bragged about the fact that you know, our property tax levy, when you compare it to the metro community, we always rank, you know, among the lowest. Mm -hmm. um, we've never been at the bottom, but we've been among the lowest. But I've always also had kind of this sense that when you look across the state, that we have fared very well as well. Sure. Um, but I've never really had, you know, any information to support that. So um, this is good information and, and I'd like to have it so that, you uh, you know, that I can refer to it when people talk about our, our tax rate here in Johnson, because as you've already said, and, and, and the council and the staff know this, we work very, very hard to keep that property tax levy as low as possible, but at the same time address the, uh, the needs of our community. And, and I think we do a phenomenal job of making sure that we provide, you know, the services that our residents um, expect and need um, and, and to ensure that they have a, a very high quality of life um, here in Johnston. And uh, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't just happen and it, it, and it doesn't happen easily. It's through the hard work of our staff and our council to make sure that, that we do put together a budget that um, is responsible um, and one that um, you know, does what we needed to do for our residents. So thanks to everyone for the great job that you continue to do on this. Um, 
uh, Teresa, I just wanted to say that uh, it was a, a fabulous presentation. You've done a great job. You did a great job explaining it. Is this PowerPoint going to be available on the city website? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Thank you. And the whole budget is already out there and the CIP. So uh, I had Janet put it out there on Friday for me. Any other comments or questions from the council? I would just kind of agree with everything that's been said. I, I think you know, Teresa and the team have done a great job pulling everything together. And I think we did a really good job this year as a council and, and the mayor uh, coming to a good quick consensus on the budget for this year that you know keeps our levy uh, flat, um, but at the same time invests in some additional police officers and other things that are important. So I think it's uh, one of the, it was one of the more, the more the smoother, more budget processes I've, we've been a part of over the last uh, several years. And, you know, even when it's not smooth, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's good to talk through those issues. And this year we were just, it was a little easier to kind of come to consensus and uh, feel really good about it. So. Other comments, council? This is a public hearing on this item. Is there anyone uh, that is with us this evening that would like to address the council um, on the budget? Please indicate by uh, writing it into indicating your interest in the uh, chat box. Cindy, do we have anyone? No, we do not. Okay, we will close the public hearing then at 7.54. We have at least, uh, it looks like three resolutions in front of us. So do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-70? So moved, Martin. Second, Evans. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Cindy Bolt, please. Councilmember Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Temple. Yes. Motion passed. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21 71? No hey, move, Martin. Second. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Temple? Yes. Go. Yes. Motion passed. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21 72? Move Evans. Second. We have a motion and a second. Cindy vote, please. Council member, Council member Martin. Yes. Ready? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Go. Yes. Evans. Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to the next item, and it too is a public hearing, item 5B. to conduct a public hearing and consider resolution number 21-80, approving and authorizing execution of a development agreement by and among the city of Johnston, Underground Magnetics Inc. and Blue Tree LLC and resolution 21-76, sponsoring Underground, Mag Underground Magnetics Iowa Economic Development Authority high quality jobs program application. And we'll open this public hearing at 7.55. Cindy, if you could start by pulling up the attachment number four vicinity map and then transition over to attachment number two for the renderings, please. Uh, Underground Magnetics um, currently owns uh, a building. Uh, it's right at 5501 to the left of 5401, uh, which is where this proposed project is. Uh, but they're proposing a $6.5 million, 38,000 square foot office and warehousing uh, building. Um, on the east side of their current building on Johnston Drive. Uh, we're proposing the uh, development agreement uh, under the terms of the expanded uh, TIF policy for the city, which would be a five-year, 90% increment property tax uh, rebate back to underground magnetics. Uh, the total rebate amount would not exceed $803,290. Um, and that uh, expanded TIF program is for projects that are specifically over a million dollars in investment, create high quality jobs and include a building and or include a building that exceeds the city's design standards. Uh, similar projects in the past that received this would include the Hubble Birchwood spec building, 
and Quartetta's Beaver Creek 2 building. Uh, Underground Magnetics uh, is proposing to create a minimum of four new high quality jobs, as well as retain 12 existing full-time positions. Uh, they also would intend to include in this building uh, several other companies that fall within their umbrella corporation uh, in the future, um, but uh, no specific jobs or wages have been established for those um, companies at this time. Uh, the project hasn't gone through planning and zoning yet, so this might be the first time that you've seen it. Uh, but what you're seeing there is a rendering of the proposed building um, with the office on the foreground there uh, with a stone facade and glass and then precast concrete on the warehousing side on the far side of the building uh, would also include natural stone floor. Uh, Blue Tree is the holding company for underground magnetics and underground magnetics would be the primary occupant of the facility. Uh, they do design engineering and sale of horizontal directional, directional drilling locating systems. Uh, so then you do trenchless boring, uh, basically at the tip of that, they create a sensor and install a sensor that helps you avoid running into other items that may be underground, such as cable uh, or fiber or sewer uh, or water. So this is the uh, US uh, world headquarters for underground magnetics, uh, their existing facility, and this would be an expansion on that. And then the, the company also owns property along Highway 141 in between the Beaver Creek Golf Course uh, for potential additional expansion as well. Uh, this project's in the East Central Urban Renewal District. Uh, the proposed rebates are accounted for in the Urban Renewal Plan. And the incentive package was recommended for approval by the Ad, Ad Hoc Economic Development Committee. Uh, public notice was printed in the Des Moines Register. Uh, no comments were received. Uh, and then there's also a second resolution attached to this. Underground Magnetics is applying for the Iowa Economic Development Authority Site Quality Job Program. Uh, that does require sponsorship by the host city, as well as a potential uh, incentive match as well, which would be fulfilled by this proposed development agreement. Uh, the exact amount of their state application is a little in flux, but it will be at or, or exceeding $130,200 investment tax credit and $195,000 uh, sales service and tax refund. Uh, there are a number of other attachments included there. Uh, won't pull up unless anybody has questions, but happy to answer any questions on the overall agreement or the uh, included attachments. Does council have any questions for Adam? I do, Suresh. Uh, Adam, quick question for you. Underground magnetics, what, what do they actually do? I see that they develop trenching and things like that. I thought my understanding of that was a bit different than what he's explained here. Can you give me an overview of what they actually do? Yeah, uh, and actually, I just uh, let me I'll just give you the summary directly from Huey. Um, so his uh, specific definition of underground magnetics is they design, market, and sell the locators for the horizontal directional drilling. Um, they sell both to the dealers and directly to the end users. Uh, those end users being the directional drilling companies uh, that use those locators um, to install infrastructure. Uh, and so that this project then you know, includes the 38,000 square feet, 18,000 of that is uh, for office and the balance is for warehousing. So uh, within those drilling equipments, uh, they engineer, design uh, and fabricate a very, a very small specific component of that. Um, that from my understanding at least is uh, for helping avoid uh, conflicting uh, utilities that are underground uh, that they'd be boring near or underneath. Okay. Other questions for Adam? This is a public hearing on this item. Uh, Cindy, do we have anyone that would like to address the council? Not at this time. Okay, we'll give them 30 seconds to uh, indicate their interest in the chat box. Not sure if that's 30 seconds, but no one has indicated they want to speak. <laughs> we'll assume they've had sufficient time to let us know. 
Okay, with that, uh, uh, we will close the public hearing then at 8.02. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-80? So moved, Evans. Second, second Martin. Co we have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote please. Council member Reddy? Yes. Temple? Councilmember Temple? Yes. Councilmember Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion passed. Cindy, did you record two votes for John? <laughs> I did. I wasn't sure on the other one. I think it was three. <laughs> well, let's see if he does as well this the, on the next one. Do we have a motion? Yeah, try to and keep that under control. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a motion? To Motion to approve resolution number 21-76. So moved. Move Martin. Evans. Second Evans. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote please. Council Member Temple. Yes. Cope. Yes. Evans. Yes. Martin. Yes. Ready. Yes. Yes. Motion Sorry. passed. Yes. Moving on to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So move, Martin. I second, Suresh. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Temple? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to the consent non-consent agenda, item 8A, consider second reading of ordinance number 1049, amending chapter 69 to modify parking prohibited for hazardous locations. And I think this was Matt. Yes, good evening, Mayor and Council. We have uh, not received any further comments on this item. Okay. Council, any questions? Mm -hmm. If not, do we have a motion to approve second reading of ordinance number 1049? So moved, Temple. Second, Evans. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Temple? Yes. Cope? Yes. Motion passed. Item 8B, consider second reading of ordinance number 1050, amending chapter 62 to add engine brake section. Mm -hmm. Good evening again. <laughs> We've also received no comments on this item as well. Okay, council, any questions? If not, do we have a motion to approve second reading of ordinance number 1050? So moved, I Martin. Move. I second. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Council member Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Temple? Yes. Hope? Yes. Evans? Councilmember Evans. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Nope. <laughs> Thank you. Nope. Motion passed. <laughs> <laughs> Item 8C, consider second, second reading of ordinance number 1048, an ordinance amending the Johnson revised ordinances of 20 of 2007, chapter 65, to modify the locations of stop intersections and yield intersections. This is probably Matt again. Uh, Aaron Wolf on behalf of Clayton Ender. Um, he, I believe he presented this at the last meeting. So this is second reading. There's been no changes since the first. Council, have any questions? If not, do we have a motion to approve second reading of ordinance number 1048? So moved, Martin. I second. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Council member Reddy? Yes. Temple? Yes. Hope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion passed. Item 8D, consider the following items related to lot 10 of Windsor Office Park, located north of Windsor Parkway and east of Northwest 90th Street. Resolution 21-66, approving the site plans for 8951 Windsor Parkway. Resolution 21-67, approving a minor amendment to the Windsor Office Park PUD to allow the use of stone in lieu of brick towards satisfaction of the 50% building materials requirement. 
Resolution 21-78, approving a minor amendment to the Windsor Office Park PUD regarding the front yard setback adjacent to Northwest 90th Street for Lot 10, Windsor Office Park Plat 1. <clears throat> this is Aaron Wolf again. Okay. Um, GTG Construction is seeking council approval of the site plans for an office building on Lot 10 of Windsor Office Park. Um, you can see a, the property is in the blue crosshatch there on your screen. It's at the uh, corner of Windsor Parkway and Northwest 90th Street. Um, Cindy, if you will, please pull up the maybe page eight of the site plans. Okay, that's good. Um, the property, okay, okay, again, it's at the corner of uh, Northwest 90th Street and Windsor Parkway. And um, as you can see from this drawing here, there's a access from both streets. There's an access to the north parking lot off of Northwest 90th Street and the south parking lot off of Windsor Parkway. Um, as a corner lot, there are effectively two front yards and the front yard setback for this PUD is 50 feet adjacent to both streets. Um, the site plans are showing a 25 foot setback adjacent to Northwest 90th Street. And the applicant is requesting an amendment to the PUD to accommodate that reduced setback. So against Windsor Parkway, they've, they've met the 50 foot setback. Um, the Northwest 90th Street side, which would effectively be a side yard. Um, but again, it, because it fronts a street, it has to meet that 50 foot setback. They're requesting 25 feet. Um, the site plan is in compliance with our open space provisions and landscaping. They depict 13 trees and 19 shrubs on the site. Uh, stormwater detention is provided in two connected basins. They're on the uh, eastern property boundary. Uh, the, the northern basin outlets to an existing swale that's located at the northeast property line, and that swale flows east toward northwest 86th Street. Um, Cindy, if you would, um, you opened some architectural elevations earlier. If you would flip over to those, great. Um, with regard to architecture, the proposed architectural materials include cast stone masonry and metal wall panels to meet the 75% permanent materials requirement of city code. Uh, this PUD does have some additional architectural restrictions that require 50% of any wall area facing a public street be composed of at least 50% brick. And the applicant is seeking council acceptance of stone toward that requirement instead of brick. Um, and to accept stone in lieu of brick would require a minor amendment to the PUD. And this PUD has been amended previously to allow other similar requests. An example would be in 2016, uh, there was an amendment for Premier Lending Alliance at 8831 Thomas Avenue uh, to allow the use of stone in lieu of brick. And more recently, the PUD was amended for set point mechanical at 8951 Thomas Avenue. Um, that was just, just this last February, um, again, for the same request to allow stone in lieu of brick. And so because this is the third request in the last five years to accept stone in lieu of brick in this PUD, I'm actually suggesting that council consider an amendment to the entire PUD allowing the use of stone or brick uh, throughout the PUD instead of considering each lot on an individual basis. Um, I do want to draw council attention to the uh, garage door on the west end of the building. And the building occupant is Impact 7G. They perform a variety of services related to environmental assessments and environmental drilling is among those services. And the garage space will be used to store drilling equipment and field equipment for environmental sampling. Um, they do not conduct maintenance on their equipment um, on site, uh, just simply be used to uh, store that uh, drilling rig. It's a large truck. In our code of ordinances and the PUD are silent on garage doors, um, but indoor storage of equipment is certainly preferable to storing equipment outdoors. And I do think the elevations depict an attractive building and the garage door is a minor element of the design. Um, I did 
uh, mail a notice to adjacent property owners. I received no comments. And I do believe we have some representatives here with us tonight, although I can't see our list of participants. Um, I believe we would have uh, Tyler Baumgarten with GTG and Bob Gibson with CDA if you should have any questions for the applicant. But if you have any questions for me, I can answer those now. Does Council have any questions for um, Aaron? Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. Uh, I, I do. Uh, Aaron, can you pull, can you uh, pull up one of the site plans, uh, either the layout or the grading plan? Um, I'm a little concerned that if a person in a wheelchair wanted to visit this building using the public sidewalks, they might have a challenge getting to the front, of, front door or even the back door. Okay, um, there is a connection to that public sidewalk. There's public sidewalk adjacent to Bull Streets and there is a connection um, you see there at Northwest 90th Street that could take a person um, up to the front door of the, of the building um, for, for the but public there, entry. Yep, but there's not a curb cut where it goes across that driveway unless there's no curb on that driveway. And I would ask if Tyler Mobgarten is with us here tonight. Tyler, are, are you, uh, have you joined us? Aaron, this is a question more for me, Bob. Okay. So this is Bob Gibson with Civil Design Advantage, 3405 Southeast Crossroads Drive in Grimes. The, that sidewalk does indeed cross that driveway. There is a curb, but we, we've lowered it. There, there is actually no curb where that sidewalk crosses. So it's an un, unimpeded crossing of that driveway. Very good. And then how about the entrance on the north side of the building? There, um, there is no, no provision there for accessibility there. It's not required by law because it's provided from the front. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Other questions for either Adam or the developer? If not, do we have anyone else with us this evening that would like to address the council on this item? Before you call for a motion, Madam Mayor, um, I wanna remind the council you're looking at three resolutions tonight, resolution excuse me, resolution 2166 would approve the site plans, 2167 would um, amend the PUD to allow the use of stone and or brick toward the 50% materials requirement throughout the PUD, and resolution 2178 would approve a 25 foot setback for lot 10 adjacent to Northwest 90th Street. So you're considering three resolutions. Thank you for the summary of those, Aaron. Uh, Mayor, I had one comment. Um, sure. Maybe I missed it on the site plan, but we usually have had a note or something on the site plan on the parking that that wheelchair loading aisle be marked as no parking. Did I miss that or is that not here? Aaron, do you know? It's not there, John, but I would accept a uh, friendly amendment to or, or ex I would accept a motion that would add that as a condition to resolution 2166. Oh, whoever makes that motion, if you could do that, that'd be great. Well. If we're ready for a motion, I'll make the first motion. There you go. <laughs> All right, I'll move approval of resolution. What's the number again? 2166. 2166 with the addition of the requirement to add the no parking uh, signage in some manner to the wheelchair unloading zone. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Temple? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Motion passed. We have next uh, resolution number 2167. Do we have a motion? So moved. Moved Evans. Second, Evans. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yeah. Temple? Yes. 
Motion passed. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-78? So moved, Temple. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Temple? Yes. Oh. Yes. Motion passed. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Moving on to item 8E, consider approval of claims in the amount of $929,508.72. Do we have a motion? Move approval, Move. Evans. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Cindy, vote, please. Council Member Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Temple? Yes. Hope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to city administrator staff comments. Jim, it looks like you have uh, three listed there tonight. I've just got one other comment, Mayor, and just okay. to remind the council. Um, this is one of those times where we have three weeks between council meetings. So it's too bad. With that, yeah, with that I, will, uh, I will let the other um, uh, staff talk about the, those other items. Okay. So we have uh, item 9B, which is the 2021 All Star Community Award. And would that be David or? I believe it's Janet. Janet, yep. Janet, okay. Hey, before so you start, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's it's Temple speaking. I'm run up against a hard deadline, so I'm going to have to log off. Okay. All right. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Hey, John. Um, just wanted to raise your awareness that the All Star Community Award is due on Friday, April 2nd. We will be submitting um, the new Johnston City Hall for this building. Um, I have talked with the League of Cities. Um, and they thought this would be a great project to submit. So I'll be working with Adam and David to get the information put together to get that submitted. Fantastic. Any questions for Janet on that? Item 9C, 2021 construct construction project update. And who would this be? This would be Matt. Okay. Yeah, we've, uh, we're <clears throat> moving from, <clears throat> excuse me, moving from winter season to construction season. <laughs> I just wanted to talk about Northwest 62nd Avenue and Merle Hay, Merle Hay Road project real quick. Uh, we held our public information meeting last week. We had approximately 15 um, people in attendance, had some good discussion about the upcoming project. Um, on the map, you can see where we're going to have our road closure there in the orange just on the east end of Lawson, um, east towards the east on Northwest 62nd. Uh, that is slated to close down August 22nd um, at 9 a.m. March. I think April 22nd, Matt. Oh. <laughs> oh, March. sorry. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Actually, it's it's not. It's March. <laughs> it's March it is. Too. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um. <laughs> Thanks, Jim, for, for, for that correction. Um, it's March 22nd. Um, we, Janet has helped get that word out through the website and social media, as well as we do have electronic message boards set up on the project to notify the traveling public out there. Um, however, you will see the contractor will begin work um, this week, weather permitting. Um, he needs to prepare to put in the temp roads for the residents there to the east, as well as they plan on to do some of the grading work along Merle Hay Road for the trails. Um, with that, um, we also have communicated with uh, Laura Kaser and Thomas Bartello with the school district. And we do have a plan. You can see here on the map as well, uh, the purple coming from Merle Hay will be the parent pickup and drop off. And then the bus in the magenta color there will be coming off of 54th to keep that traffic, traffic separated. Any questions on this project? Um, I do have a question. So you're saying that 62nd will be closed, but they'll have signage saying parent pick up, parent pick up is okay? Or is that portion of the road open? The portion of the road that, that's there in purple will still be open. We will just be closing their east access point and then closing it about six to 700 feet to the east to, to finish the work. The contractor has a little bit of storm sewer to install 
um, all the sanitary and water is completed and then to repave that road. Okay. And how long? Matt, Matt, go ahead, Tom, uh, Councilman Cole. So when, as part of stage B, stage 2B, does that include the sidewalk um, and through that area as well? Yeah, the sidewalk will be completed from, from stage 2B there, the orange, all the way down to Four Pines where you can see the sidewalk down to the east. That'll okay, include. great, thanks. Matt you, might, you, Matt, you might have said this, but how long will that portion, that orange portion be closed? Uh, the contractor is predicting six to eight weeks. Um, May 15th is their contract deadline. Um, however, with, with Mother Nature in the spring, um, we'll see if we can hit that. We're, we're planning to hit that. Actually, the contractor has already asked if they can work seven days a week. Oh, yes. <laughs> we, we, we have told them that uh, that would be okay, um, but we may have to restrict their hours on Sunday. Okay. Other questions for Matt on that? Doesn't sound like it, Matt. Okay, um, we've got two other items real quick. We've got the Northwest Beaver Drive Trail and Overlay Project Information Meeting. We just got it scheduled for uh, March 23rd. It will be a virtual meeting um, from 5.30 to 6.30. Uh, the contractor has moved his date up. He wants to start the week of April 5th. He's now looking at March 29th. Um, I will get an invite out on that meeting to, to the mayor and council um, later this week. And then also our Northwest 54th Avenue phase two, which is from 86th Street to 91st Street, um, will also will have a public information meeting on that that'll be held virtually on March 25th. And the contractor is scheduled to start that April 5th. And I will also get a meeting invite out to, to everyone on both of those meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, can you put that your 60 second map back up there again? Or Cindy or whoever? Um, Matt, do you want to? I know there's not a colored line there, but since you and John and I talked and determined there was remaining Merle Hay Trail money, do you want to explain to the council what else you're going to do over here? Sure. Here at the intersection, we've got a trail running uh, east along 62nd. We do have a trail south on Merle Hay, and it's the fairway property. Uh, we've uh, John had asked if we if we can go ahead and construct a trail from the intersection of Merle Hay and 62nd um, down to the fairway where we have the trail, which will lead all the way to essentially 60th Street and to the inner urban. So. Um, with the remaining trail funds that they had left, we're going to change order that into this project. Nice. So I know that wasn't a color, but we had talked about it last week and I thought he should remind or tell you about that. And that'll be done this year, Matt? Yes, that's, uh, that one may take just a little bit longer. It wasn't in the original um, contract, but we hope to have that completed by the end of May. Okay, great. And that's all the updates I have. Okay, great. Hey, Matt, can I jump in, Matt? Yes. I got a call today about the guys doing tree removal up on Beaver and that there they're, is just a, one of the workers stepping out into the street to direct traffic. Can you okay. take a look at that? I will do that. We'll get that corrected. Thank you. Thank you. Item 9D, AMU, AMU Safety Group Dividend. Oh, this is just a quick written report to you uh, to tell you what this year's dividend was for our IAMU Safety Group. Our, our insurance casualty package is part of the safety group through the Municipal Utility um, Association and this year's dividend um, came in for our policy that ended in March of 2020 always comes a year later and our dividend was uh, $16,308.26 and so we just put that back towards our claims for next year and um, we've heard that the uh, cities that are in ICAP which is the other big pool for cities are facing uh, 20 to 30 percent insurance um, increases. Um, ICAP 
uh, had cities like Cedar Rapids and some of the other bigger cities that really suffered uh, huge losses through the derecho. So um, we've been told, Cindy, gee, what did, did he tell us 15, 10 to 15%? I believe so, yes. Yeah, we haven't seen our policy increase for this year, but um, it's substantially less than the ICAP group is going to be receiving. And Plus, it, we still had a dividend. Yeah. So ours is increasing, Teresa? Mm -hmm. And is that as a result of derecho as well? Oh, yes. Okay. Other questions for Teresa? If not, we'll go to uh, city council comments. Uh, Councilman Cope. Yeah, just a couple of quick ones. First of all, I just want to, I had a, a person who owns land in Johnston stop me at the Capitol the other day and had some great comments about some, some interactions she'd had with uh, both the city water department staff and also a building department staff. So I just want to pass that along. It was really positive. Second of all, I want to thank John Schmitz for helping to pull together a meeting that uh, the mayor and I participated in with a citizen who had some concerns about uh, the 86th Street Trail project and tree removal behind his home. Um, that clearly is the most popular project we've got going on in our community right now. And uh, uh, he had that constituent had some concerns and kind of unique circumstance. He had just moved to the area late last fall, um, but uh, I thought the meeting went really well. And John, I thought you and the folks from HR Green and, and, and also the folks from uh, Green Meadows West Homeless Association by bringing them all together really gave that person an opportunity to, to have his voice heard. And so just wanted to pass along my appreciation for that. And lastly, um, I, I noticed um, kind of again, going back to this 86th Street project um, that I, I, don't, I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook to start with, but the, or the city's Facebook page, but notice that I think the city staff is doing a really good job. And I presume this is Janet and your team of when people post comments on Facebook of actually responding to them and trying to kind of provide some additional information, which I, I which might in reading through those, the, the folks who who um, who then see that response I have, have been historically, it appears to be really appreciate that. I think it's really hard to try to figure out what exactly to say when somebody's kind of really roasting you on Facebook, but I, I, I want to give the city staff um, kudos for trying to figure out the right thing to say, being being willing to say it, because I think, frankly, a lot of times it's really interesting to sort of seeing it's almost sort of a case study of that people sort of just appreciate that they that they've been heard. Um, so anyway, just wanted to pass that along to Jan, and I thought that's been really nicely done. Thank you, Tom. We do have an information they'll post going out tomorrow morning on our social media pages, just showing the renderings. I had sent you all the information last week in regards to what. Um, it will look like after it's finished there with the homeowners association. So that information will publish on our pages tomorrow morning um, around six o'clock. So it's additional information, but it provides that frequently asked question sheet that I provided you all as well. So thank you. I appreciate the comment, Tom. Councilman Evans. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to add on the uh, Ignite project and the buildings that have been removed and how it already looks oh so much better. Ooh. So if you haven't seen it, it's it's almost worth driving to take a look at. Nice. That's it for me. Councilman Reddy. I have no comments, thank you. Councilwoman Martin. I have no comments except to uh, double up on Councilman Cope's uh, gratitude and thanks to uh, Janet for all she's doing with our social Facebook feed. I think it's very smart to get right on and reply to these people that have a gripe. It kind of takes their, it takes the energy out of their comment and it doesn't, uh, you know, then there's not other people piling on with their negative comments. So I think it's very smart and thank you. And the only thing that I would add is that with the warm weather that we had last week, you could sure see people out uh, enjoying the trails, enjoying Terra, Terra Park. And when I was walking by Beaver Creek, um, it made me wonder when we're going to start seeing kayakers and canoe, uh, canoers out there. So John, if you're still on, can you give us an update real quickly on where we're at with the, uh, um, the, 
uh, RFP on the outfitters? Yeah, the the RFP, we only had one uh, individual group that uh, sent in a uh, a detail listing of uh, uh, or proposal that they would like to see. It is the same group that came in last year, Quarry Springs Outfitters. Um, so we will be, uh, I've requested uh, from them, oh, about a week or so ago, I requested them to put together a service agreement somewhat similar to last year, but also right from the get-go looking at the usage of Terra Park as well as how they can be instrumental in green days this year as well. So they'll be putting those plans together for us to take a look at. And Great. hopefully uh, early in April, we'll have that to kind of peruse through and we'll give any suggestions back to them for edits and that, and then we'll go from there. Great, very good, very good. Well, I know that if we, we had a teaser last week um, and if the weather, turns warm again, um, people will be anxious to get out. So thank you for yeah. that update. There's finally a little bit of water in the creek. Oh yeah, no, it looks great and it is so clear. I mean, I, you, can, you, you, know, you can see clear to the bottom. It's just, it's just very inviting. <laughs> so anything else for the go to the order? Mayor and Council, this is uh, Chief Clark. And just a reminder that the statewide tornado drill will be happening uh, a week from Wednesday on the 24th of March. And this year they're changing it up a little bit. It's gonna be at 11 o'clock in the morning. Traditionally, they've done it about 10 o'clock with a, a watch and then they move into the warning and then they sound the sirens. But uh, that's all slated to be a little bit different and happen at 11 a.m. Uh, next Wednesday, the 24th. Okay, thank you for that, Chief. Anything else? If not, uh, happy St. Patty's Day. We we are adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Thank everyone. you. Good night.